Harrow believed that when a cause is righteous, providence guides the hand of the humble and courageous. Season 5 of The Dragon Prince is coming in just a few weeks. And I wanted to talk about the person we all want to know more about since their first appearance. The character that captivated my heart upon hearing his first line in the show. Viren, didn't I tell you if you ever woke me up this early again, I'd have you executed. You saw the thumbnail, you knew this was about Harrow. As much as I want to know and talk about Arvos, I just want to see Pip. Where is he? We have not seen him since the end of season 2, but I know it's just a matter of time. So even if this theory is rather straightforward, I still want to talk about it because Harrow is just a character worth talking about. And while I feel like everyone is pretty on board with the theory that Viren trapped Harrow's soul within Pip's body, and the theory has been discussed plenty here on YouTube, it's still clearly not enough because here I am. And here you are too, so I know I'm not the only one who wants more Harrow, or at least an update on Pip. So I hope I'm still able to add something to the conversation by including as much foreshadowing that I could find, mostly by focusing on the novelization of the show since it does give more context to what's happening on screen. And there is no better place to start than the beginning, so without any further ado, let's talk about Harrow's introduction. In the show, we first meet Harrow as Viren very rudely enters his chambers in the early morning. As soon as he goes in, before we even see Harrow, we first see Pip. The frame lasts less than a second, so it is easy to miss, but it is worth mentioning that the first thing we associate with him is his animal companion. And once we have seen both of them, we first hear Pip's song, and then we hear Harrow's voice. This is further cemented in the Art of the Dragon Prince, where even earlier drafts of his character design are pictured with Pip beside him. In the novel, we actually get to meet Harold before we meet him in the show as he's visiting the chambers of his sons to wish them a good night. This is when we find out that their mother Sarai died when Ezrin was an infant. Since then, Harold visits their chambers nearly every night to sing him a lullaby. Although Pip is nowhere to be seen, he and Harold are still intrinsically tied together because Pip is not just any bird, he is a songbird. In this scene, not only is he tied to Pip through the act of singing, but Harrow's fate is actually foreshadowed by none other than Ezrin. Here's the exchange after he sings him that lullaby. I love that you still sing that to me. Even though it's for little kids, it makes me happy. Good, the king answered. Will you still sing to me when I'm grown up? I want you to. If you still want me to, then yes. Even when I'm king, you have to promise me that you'll still sing to me. Harrow hesitated, but then answered, I will always watch over you, even when you are king. He leaned over and pressed a warm kiss onto Ezrin's forehead. What's worth highlighting here is that if Ezrin were to be king, it's because Hera would be dead. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Anyway, this is when we first see that Ezrin has yet to consider the possibility of losing his dad. Or maybe he's actually sensing his death, one or the other. But either way, not only is Harrow aware of this, but at this point he must have known that it was only a matter of time before Sadia retaliated for the loss of the Dragon King and their heir, so he hesitates to answer and gives Ezrin a vague response. So, so far, Harrow's death has definitely been foreshadowed and his character is intrinsically tied to Pip. It's similar to the fact that Ezrin is introduced beside Bay to introduce his affinity with animals and Callum is always next to his sketchbook to illustrate his artistic nature. So this association with Pip is definitely done on purpose. But with that said, let us go over the indications that Harrow is now in Pip's body. There are plenty of unanswered questions around King Harrow's death since the last time we see him is when he's humbling Viren in his final hours. By the time Renan shoots the arrow and the assassin's binding comes undone, we don't get a glimpse of Harrow's body nor during his funeral. And while we don't get to see a lot of the action, there is enough information for us to imply the series of events. We see Viren head into the king's chambers with the soul fang, but he is no longer carrying anything when he leaves the chamber. This will most certainly not be the case if Hera was in a position to give an order, because he does not look at the soul fang with kind eyes. Then why have you returned with that abomination? Hera most certainly would have asked that he take it with him on his way out. But as we know, Viren walks out empty-handed, and is certainly implied to have used the two-headed Solfang, since in the novel, we get some insight into Viren's thoughts before we never hear from Harrow again. You are a servant of the Kingdom of Catalis. You are a servant. Silent, Viren bent to his knees. 
he'd been stupid to even consider making the sacrifice. The king didn't consider him a brother or even a friend. In the king's eyes, he was worthless. He was nothing. Viren's heart turned as cold as a stone beneath his knees. If he wanted to defy his former friend one last time, he'd have to do it tonight. At this point, Harold has already accepted his death and refused Viren's proposal to have his soul live in the body of another. But we get even more insight into the Slytherin snake that he is, given that he is admitting to having defied the king multiple times already. And trust and believe that this is not the last time Viren will defy Harrow and desecrate the memory of their friendship. But let's talk about that later because even before he went into the king's chambers, it seems Viren already planned to go through with the procedure since he carries the paw of a mummified cat, knowing someone would want to scream out. It's unclear what he means by this since we can assume that he did in fact plan to go through with the sacrifice himself, but then again, he probably knew Hera would reject him and plan to go through with the procedure either way. And let me tell you how I know. Whenever Viren justifies the use of dark magic, it is through a heroic lens. But in his mind, we get a glimpse of his real motivations. This is what he's thinking as he returns to his study after his proposal is originally rejected. If Hera had behaved according to plan, Viren would be amid one of his greater magical achievements, exploiting the two-headed Solfang serpent to channel the king's soul into the body of another. But no, King Harrow had selected today to develop a moral code. When Viren justifies the use of the soul fang to others, it is about saving Harrow's life, but in his mind, it's not about the king at all. It's about displaying Viren's magical capacity and prowess. Also, this chapter is literally called a change of soul. So, you know, make of that what you will. But either way, after he is humbled by Harrow, we don't get to see the basket with the soul fang again. Viren is not carrying anything when he leaves the chambers, but there are other details revealed through Callum's perspective. When he goes to tell Harrow about the dragon egg, Callum bumps into Viren coming out of the room. He reached for the door, but just then, someone pushed it open from the inside. Viren emerged, and Callum gasped. His eyes were the color of soot. Viren slammed the door behind him and glanced at Callum. His eyes faded to their normal steely gray. You should not be here, Viren said to Callum. Callum looked around. Had anyone else seen the High Mage's creepy eyes? This man had stolen the precious dragon egg. What dark magic had he been up to in the king's chambers? Even Callum knows it. The series of events that follow are also a huge giveaway that Harrow is somehow immobilized in his chambers because when the Moonshadow Elves come to complete their mission, Callum calls out for King Harrow by calling him Dad. This is honestly the biggest giveaway. Just a couple minutes before, Ezrin encourages Callum to call him dad since Ezrin probably knows that it would make Harrow happy. So presumably, this is the first time ever that Callum refers to Harrow as dad. And do you think he wouldn't be running out of the door to help his son that he loves with all his heart? No, okay, there's just no way. Harrow would have left those chambers even if it meant that an arrow struck him the moment he opened that door. Once the king dies, Viren holds the funeral procession, which is out of line on multiple fronts. It is Catolian tradition to mourn fallen kings for seven sunsets, but Viren ignores all that and holds the funeral procession mere hours after the king's death. Opeli and the other torchbearers refuse to light the pyre, but Claudia is instructed to finish the ritual and his body turns to ash. And remember how I said Viren continues to desecrate his former friend? Yeah, so not only does Viren not even attempt to look for Harrow's sons after his death, he doesn't allow the kingdom to mourn their king as dictated by tradition, but to add insult to injury, he does not even allow Harrow to burn naturally. The fire circled King Harrow's body like a buzzard honing in on its prey and then plummeted into the pyre. A moment later, a massive blaze enveloped the king. Opeli, the torchbearers, and the citizens watched in horror as King Harrow's casket turned to smoke and ashes. In minutes, the only remnants of the king were the dark plumes drifting skyward. Viren looked at his daughter with satisfaction. Then, he stood in front of the altar, the fiery blaze dancing behind his head like a crown of flames. When a ruler of Catullus dies, we mourn for seven days. But we are at war. Today, we must mourn sevenfold. For tonight, there will be a coronation. This man literally has no respect. Complete disregard for the living and the dead. 
Not even Harold's ashes would be safe. But seriously, Viren was just waiting for the moment of Harold's death to crown himself king. Speaking of the coronation, let's go back to talking about Pip. The following day, Viren returns to the king's chambers. King Harold's room was still scarred from the battle the night before last. The curtains were shredded and the furniture was overturned. The only living reminder of Harold was his songbird Pip, sitting silently in its golden cage. Viren walked over to a large mirror which had the coronation robes laid out nearby. To be fair, time is of the essence for him, but this further establishes the beginning of his reign as a sort of coup. No order has been restored, even to the royal chamber. That is just how desperate he is. Just as he's about to get ready, even Claudia questions whether the people of Catullus are ready to accept the transition of power, since, you know, Harold does have heirs to the throne, but he dismisses the very valid political concern by claiming that the princes are dead, and I suppose it doesn't really matter since it's only a matter of time before he orders their assassination. But anyway, he continues to get ready for the coronation with the help of attendants. But by the time they placed the last layer of robes on Viren's shoulders, a strange tension had seized the room. The attendants seemed to be murmuring amongst themselves. Viren tried to ignore it. He didn't have time for silly gossip today, but he eventually lost his patience. What is it? What are you idiots all whispering about? No one dared answer, but a few pairs of eyes flicked over to the songbird. Pip was staring at Viren, glaring even. A slow smile crept over Viren's face. Oh, he said, turning to face the bird and patting down his robes. No song for the occasion? Pip remained still and silent. Wasn't expecting one, Viren thought to himself with a smirk. Then he stepped through the curtains and onto the balcony. So the attendants are helping him get ready in King Harold's destroyed room as his caged bird is staring at them and Viren openly taunts him. If there is one thing this man has, it's definitely the audacity. We don't get too many updates on Pip until he escapes in season 2. In the book, there's actually no mention of Pip escaping, but that's because the action is being told through Viren's skewed perspective. When he's confronting the first set of soldiers, Viren's attention immediately goes to the doorway of his study being opened. He rushes to close it, and if Pip is at his study at this point, then he escapes unbeknownst to Viren. It is through the show that those gaps are filled in, and we see him fly away. But now, at this point in time, Pip is currently unaccounted for. There is no doubt in my mind that it's only a matter of time before it's confirmed that Harold became the songbird Pip, just given the sheer amount of blatant foreshadowing. But you've probably heard most of that already, so I'm gonna go above and beyond and claim that this fate not only makes sense for his character, but it's actually also a suitable end for his reign. Let's explore this a little bit further and break down where it all went wrong. Why don't you join me, Viren? I think his fate was undeniably sealed the day that Harold agreed to hunt the Magma Titan, but it arguably all began when Harrow asked Viren to join him in his official portrait as king. When I went back to watch this scene, I only had one reaction. Where is your wife? Where is your wife? Okay, I know she just stepped out of the room, but like, what do you mean who's gonna stand by me through anything? Sir, that is your wife. They literally discussed and agreed on the way that they wanted to rule the kingdom together. It's a Rai who was gonna stand by him. I just, I can't, okay? I am baffled by this decision. King Harold is kind of an idiot, but okay, we're gonna give Harold the benefit of the doubt and say that this portrait was not even the event that sealed his fate and assume that everything was fine until the Queens of Durn came asking for help. It is at this point, without a doubt, that Harold should have known that Viren was not on his side. And remember when we read that part that Viren was going to defy his former friend one last time? Yeah, this is the first time we see him do it. And also, when Harrow said- I have tolerated your arrogance for too long, maybe even encouraged it. That was not only not a lie, but a severe understatement. When the Queens of Durin came seeking help from Catullus and Harrow ran the plan by Queen Sarai, she asks him to promise that he won't use dark magic. Harrow cannot bring himself to confirm or deny, so he simply remained silent. But later that day, once King Harrow had bathed and recovered from sparring with Queen Sarai, she sent for the Queens of Durin to meet him and Lord Viring in the throne room. He had a few hours to reflect on what Sarai had said and why he'd even been motivated to get her opinion in the first place. He no longer wanted to use dark magic to help. My queens, Harold said, Catullus will do everything we can to help the people of Durin. We will share all the grain that we have. No, King Harold, we must decline your offer, Queen Neha interrupted. 
What? He asked. He passed a hand through his thick hair in shock. Why would they refuse any help at all? That was certain death for their people. Queen Neha looked at Queen Annika, who nodded solemnly. She wiped a tear from her cheek. We have learned that Catalis barely has enough food for its own people. We cannot accept such a sacrifice, she said. King Harold could barely speak. He could hazard a guess at who told the queens about Catalis's mediocre grain supply. He was certain the queens had been forced into this moral dilemma. Very well. There was no use arguing, but he hated feeling so powerless. He sunk back into the throne. The people of Durin are strong, Viren said. We know that you will face the hardship of the coming winter with bravery and grace. The queens bowed and turned to exit, but King Harold couldn't bear it. Couldn't bear to let them return to their people empty-handed. No, stop, he said, standing up from the throne. He looked at Viren and nodded. I can't let you leave like this. There may be a way to help everyone, the people of both our kingdoms. He knew his decision would disappoint Queen Sarai, and that weighed heavily on him, but the thought of so many innocent people starving to death outweighed his sense of right and wrong. Whew, okay, so many thoughts. So first of all, again, I don't understand. Where is Queen Sarai? I know I said I would disregard her absence, but like, where is she? I don't understand why she's not taking a part in this meeting. He made this decision based on her counsel. She stands by him. She's his queen. Hold on. She is the queen. But okay, none of that matters. We will still set that aside for the real issue in this excerpt. It's not the queens who we are enforced into the moral dilemma. The point was to force Harold into it. And this is when I feel like Harold should have known that Viren was untrustworthy. Viren clearly conspired behind Harold's back to ensure that his plan was put in motion, and he gave away some of the kingdom's sensitive information, but there's more to it because it all goes downhill from here. So, in order, Harold agrees to slay the Magma Titan. Queen Sarai, who advised against the plan from the beginning, dies in the process. While she is dying, Viren collects her last breath, and years later, he encourages Harold to take vengeance on Avisandum. Once they have killed the Dragon King, Viren is still not satisfied, and he proposes that they kill the egg, too. This is going to be a very slippery slope! Harrow is a tragic character because, despite his good intentions, he is a failure. He failed himself, he failed his wife, and he failed his children, in that order. So let's begin with Harrow himself. He begins his reign with a dream from Lady Justice. Lady Justice said that justice was more than fair decisions and fair consequences. True justice was a fair system. Then she laid before me her scales, her sword, and her blindfold and told me to choose. Hera, of course, chose the blindfold. The blindfold gives us a way to test the system. She said that I should use it to imagine that I had not been born yet and that I did not know if I would be born rich or poor, what color my skin would be, what culture or practices my family would have, that a fair system should be fair no matter the accident of my birth that the rights and laws and opportunities within the system should stand to protect and empower everyone. So, clearly he failed to learn the lesson from Lady Justice, right? If a system is fair, no matter the accident of one's birth, then Harold should have taken into account the lives of elves and other sentient creatures in Tadia. It's actually Queen Sarai that brings this to his attention when they're sparring, but Harold still gives in to the allure of dark magic without acknowledging how his decision to slay the Magma Titan contradicts his desire to be a just king. Years later, Viren comes to him with the ingredients to make the ultimate weapon of revenge. This is when he fails his wife, Sarai. And I mean, I feel like you could argue that he failed her when he disregards her counsel and leaves her out of important meetings regarding decisions of the kingdom. But again, we're being generous here, and I'm gonna say that it is years later after her death when he truly fails her. Sarai was a fierce but undeniably wholesome woman who expressed her dislike and mistrust for dark magic. Viren taking her last breath definitely crossed the line, and I'm sure Harrow knows it. We won't know what he was truly thinking until the novelization of Book 3 comes out, but I think Harrow was disturbed by Viren's admission of storing her last breath. When Viren brings out the unicorn's horn, Harrow's first reaction is one of disappointment. Viren, what have you done? Still, he gives in to Viren's temptation and defiles the spear of his deceased wife. There is no doubt in my mind that Sarai would most certainly not approve of these actions, in the slightest. 
At this point, Viren also uses Harold's values against him by claiming that killing Avicendum would be an act of justice for the death of Sarai. There is not an ounce of justice to these actions. When the humans entered Sadia, it was to hunt and kill a magical creature. Justice was the three queens dying to balance the scales of the life that they had just extinguished. And I definitely feel like that's a bit of a strong statement, but I do want to call back to the quote at the beginning of the video, where before they enter Sadia, Harold thinks to himself that when a cause is righteous, providence guides the hand of the humble and courageous. But we all know how that ended, so again, Harold fails his own moral compass, but this time he defiles the memory and spear of his wife. I think at this point you can say that he's simultaneously failing his children, but again, we're being gracious, so I'm gonna say that the moment he truly and utterly fails them is when he approves the extermination of the dragon egg. Viren claims that after what they've done, the dragon will live for vengeance, but by extinguishing it, they will prevent it. I'm sorry, what kind of logic is this? There would still be loose ends considering that the dragon queen is still alive, but Harrow fails because this is exactly what makes Ezrin a target just a couple months later. Even a 14-year-old Callum could have figured that this was an awful decision. Harold's demise was brought about by a series of events of him giving into the ease and allure of dark magic. But I honestly think Harold sealed his own fate from the beginning when he welcomed Viren into the portrait of his reign. Because even at this point, Viren is already incredibly ambitious, since he wants his portrait to be in many tomes to commemorate him in the future. With all this said, I truly think it makes sense for Harrow to still be alive and in Pip's body because it just lines up with Viren's disregard for humanity and their friendship. At this point, I want to mention that if Harrow is still alive, I don't think it cheapens the impact of death in the show. This is still a tragic fate because Harrow wanted to die. Well, you know, he didn't want to die, but he still saw his death as a natural consequence for his actions and accepted it. Now, his friend, who claims to see him as his brother, disregards Harold's wish to atone and at least let him die with some dignity, and instead, he traps his soul in the body of a songbird, then goes to lay claim to the throne and order the assassination of his children. Harold's continued existence is an act of defiance, and it's meant to trap him. It is far from being a generous gift of life. Before we approach the end, I want to quickly address the silver bindings. If Harrow is not really dead, why did the binding become a blood ribbon? Wouldn't the binding somehow reveal his survival? Why did it fall off, indicating that the job was done? Despite there being no real glaring evidence, I do have my credentials as a self-proclaimed moon mage with a pretty keen intuition, so I'm just gonna proceed with absolute confidence until the inevitable reveal of peril. Okay, so we know from season 3 that magic performed with the moon primal can detect some subtleties, since we see that the metal lotus assigned to Renan has not entirely sunk to the bottom of the pond, revealing that he's not really dead. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that the silver binding should also reveal if Harrow is still alive somehow. I absolutely agree with this train of thought, and that's why I would argue that there actually was some indication that something was not entirely right with the blood ribbon that night. But the thing about the metal lotus detecting the meddling of dark magic is that it's not immediately perceptible to the eye. Up to season 4, Ithari and Rayla were convinced that Ronan was dead because the fact that the metal lotus is suspended halfway to the bottom of the pond is not perceptible to the eye with surface level observations. But you know who probably did notice? Zim. Sim noticed, except that without Ezrin to translate, the fact that the lotus is detecting Ronan's weak life force is not immediately obvious. I think the blood ribbon also behaved strangely, but it just went unnoticed as a matter of circumstance. So let's take a look at the scene of Harrow's demise. Did you see that? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Something is definitely wrong here, but let us look at the only other frame of reference as to how the ribbon should behave. Tears formed in Rayla's eyes as she accepted that Callum was probably right. I'm so sorry. I thought he would be able to do this. I thought it was the way it had to be. She brought her hands to her face to wipe away the tears, her injured hand feeling extra cold. Wait, her binding. Callum, he's alive. Ezrin has to be alive. Look at my binding. It's still tight. It's not glaringly obvious, but it seems like the binding turning into a blood ribbon should be immediate. The second that the target is dead, that binding should be falling. 
okay? So now let's go back to Harrow's demise again and read the novelization for reference. Under the full moon, the brave women and men of the Catalis Crown Guard fought valiantly to protect their king. Many laid down their lives, but when the battle faded as nighttime ebbed, the balcony doors of the king's tower opened. A wounded survivor stumbled outside and collapsed onto his knees. One of the white bindings on his wrist turned a deep shade of crimson as if it were magically soaked in blood. It loosened and fell to the ground. Do you see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? That was clearly not immediate. Now, we know that Ronan is a seasoned professional, so shouldn't he be able to detect the difference? Honestly, that is a valid point because when it comes to the matters of life and death, a few seconds is definitely a significant delay. But at the same time, Runan is in a bind at this point. One of the team members just deserted, a new truth has been unveiled, and he just saw the remaining four members of his team fall for the sake of the mission. I feel like he's definitely allowed to have a skewed perspective of the passage of time. Rayla and the others probably would have noticed some anomaly, but neither of them were present, so the point just kind of goes unnoticed. So ultimately, I do think that the Assassin's Binding did detect the meddling of dark magic, but the ribbon still determined that justice had been served, and Hera was dead enough for it to fall off. Alright, so I think most of us are on board with this theory, but again, I want to go above and beyond, so as my last ditch ever to convince you that Hera is definitely in Pip, I want you to put on your star-touched lenses to see even beyond the constellations above Sadia and into an entirely different world. Into Planetos and the Seven Kingdoms. Um, am I gonna base this theory on a reference to an entirely different fandom? Yes, okay, yes. But in my defense, they've referenced the world of A Song of Ice and Fire before, so I feel like it's not that far-fetched to make a comparison. So, you know, j j just put on the star-touched lenses and join me on the journey. As much as the Dragon Prince pays homage to The Last Airbender, it is more heavily inspired by A Game of Thrones. I know, Harrow is considered the Dragon Prince's Uncle Iroh, but you know who I think is more like him? Ned Stark. King Harrow is the Ned Stark of the Dragon Prince. Their actions set the course for the story, but they die in the first season. And I mean, just look at these two clips. I've made many mistakes in my life, but that wasn't one of them. I would rather die a king than live as a coward. I know they're not saying the same things, but they just have the same vibe, you know? It's about a vibe here. Okay, but Ned Stark is actually not the thing I want to reference for Game of Thrones. What I want to draw comparison to is the second life that is available to skin changers. Skin changing is the ability to inhabit an animal and when a person dies, a piece of their consciousness continues to live in the animal that they skin changed. Thus, a second life. That is exactly what's happening with Harrow. This is honestly not that much of a stretch, considering how we saw Ibis turn into a flock of birds during his death ceremony at the Stormspire. A part of Ibis lives in the birds, evident by how we see one of them keeping an eye in the dragon during season 4, but of course, in the case of Harrow, his second life is an abomination because it was acquired through dark magic, and dark magic is just a perversion of primal magic. But back to skin changing, I do feel like this is a genuine concept in the world of a dragon prince because as I was listening to book 2, when Ezrin senses Sim's distress and helps him fly, he describes how he felt as though a piece of him traveled to be with Sim. This immediately made me think of the wargs of Game of Thrones. Arya is able to war against Nymeria far distances apart, and so can Bran with his wolf summer. And then in season 4, when Ezrin is trying to guide Sim to find the Pit of Despair, we see how he encourages Sim through suggestion, but if he's not in control per se, that is exactly how skin changing works because it's not as straightforward as controlling an animal, you are sharing a body with them and their consciousness. And my point is not just to say that Ezran is definitely a skin changer of sorts, but the fact that Harrow is currently experiencing something similar to a skin changer's second life. The assassin's binding became a blood ribbon because Harrow is dead even if a part of his consciousness lives. He is not and will never be entirely himself again, not only because he will never return to a human body, but because he is probably sharing his new body with Pip. And to prove my point, just listen to Viren's description of the spell. Two heads, two bites, two souls held at once. I rest my case. With that said, you can remove your star-touched lenses so that we can come to a conclusion. So if this theory is true and Harrow has now become Pip, then one can't help but wonder where he's been this whole time. 
If Hera was in Pip, I would imagine that he would have immediately flown to find Callum and Ezrin back in the Banther Lodge, only to find them missing, but at this point in time, Ezrin has been in the throne for two years, and there's still no mention of Pip. It's possible we won't get to see him play a major role anymore, since his character has transitioned from valuing justice to freedom. In his last days, he's pondering how trapped he feels by the weight of his responsibilities and, you know, probably the consequences of his actions, so much so that even in Callum's fever dream, he pictures Harrow chained down to the throne. And remember when he tells Callum, The great illusion of childhood is that adults have all the power and freedom, but the truth is the opposite. A child is freer than a king. A child is freer than a king, unless the king is a child. So yeah, it makes complete sense that Harrow would refrain from approaching his children, because by the end of season three, both Callum and Ezra know how Hera was essentially the catalyst to the war that they find themselves in. I would imagine that Hera is plagued by regret, guilt, and possibly shame that his children have to clean up the darkness that he enabled. So, you know, that is a possibility. But I didn't make this video because I think Hera is done for. I do think Hera could have a role to play in the upcoming seasons. If Pero is to show up again, it has to be tied to Viren's arc. It would be poetic capital J justice for Viren's blasphemy to be his own downfall. But now that I've seen the trailer for season 5, it's obvious that Viren is already drowning in regret after seeing firsthand how he set Claudia down a path of darkness. It's possible that in Viren's last days, Harrow will display the strength of his character by somehow aiding him and Viren will have to die being helped by the best friend that he betrayed for decades and then trapped in a bird's body. That would be absolutely beautiful. But I'm personally rooting for him to have a miserable death, especially after reading the latest Dragon Prince reflection deep below. In the short story, we see how Hera's assassination still weighs heavily on Ezrin's heart. Although it was Runan's blade that ended Hera's life, he knows that it was ultimately Zubeya who gave the order. Ezrin does not want to perpetuate the cycle of violence, so I think that cutting down one of the major sources of darkness would be the best closure for both Ezrin and Callum. If Pero reveals Viren's last betrayal, it will reiterate who and what the real enemy is, being dark magic and its practitioners. But that's all I have to say on the matter of this theory. I know Pip's reveal is imminent, and I'm certain that it'll be tied to Viren's arc because that's just what makes sense for Harrow's story. Now the real question is, when is Viren gonna die? The pacing of the Dragon Prince is a little bit hard to account for, so it may be the end of season 5, or maybe even the following season, I'm not entirely sure, but I've waited four seasons and I have no qualms on waiting some more because I know this theory is true and I will personally die on this hill. If you also know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Harrow is definitely in Pip's body, hit the like button because I know I'm not the only one who's still waiting for this reveal. But other than that, feel free to let me know what you think in the comments below. Did I miss anything? What do you think Harrow's role could be moving forward? And most importantly, I need to hear your thoughts on this. Do you all think that they killed the last Magma Titan? I sincerely doubt it has a family. Then is it the last of its kind?